community here. They were promised that one day a Messiah would come and would rescue them. And he did. His name was Jesus Christ. He spread his arms and died so that we would no longer be separated. He was the rescue pod of God. But all through biblical history, the promise of the Messiah, there was always those that would come along and would try to steal that away from the people. Today, we walk in this society, we walk as, if for those in Christ, we walk every day in this world, and the evil one comes along and tries to steal our faith, doesn't he? Somebody sent me an email about some sign down in Grand Junction. And they went on it, was poking at the president and some other things. And there was a blog underneath it. And I didn't have to go too far down in that blog before immediately I came across somebody who was an atheist, who did not believe in God, and spent several... Uh, Kevin, you sent that to me, I think. Did you read the blogs underneath? And this guy went on this big campaign trail about anybody who believes in God that we're nuts. And arguing with another guy who was giving credit to faith, and, and there were some other issues there, but I turned the computer on this morning to check my email. I went up to try to pull some of them little pictures that I put up on that opening slide for... Uh, about the Chilean miners, and so I was typing different things in to find pictures. And I typed in, you know, Chilean miners' prayer and things like that. And every time I pulled that up, I ended up that there was a blog or a, a comment or a newspaper article that it was from people talking about the issue of faith and how foolish it was. And I'm thinking, you got 33 people stuck in a hole that comes out and live off of two scoops of tuna fish and a little bit of water, a milk a day till they got some water, stay down in a hole 69 days, come up out of the ground rescued from the pit, walk out as healthy as they were, embracing and loving and testifying to God Almighty and Jesus Christ and lifting up His Word, how can you say there's no God? How, how can you say that? I could probably live a few days down in there because I'm fat as a dickens. I'd have to lose some weight just to make it in that pod. But there were people down in there that, that, that young guys, they didn't have any body fat on them. Better to be a fat man in a hole than a skinny man in a hole. Amen? <laughs> Amen? 17 days on two teaspoons of tuna fish. Man. And why tuna fish? Sometimes you look at the... You know, tuna fish might not have been a bad thing to have. There's a certain amount of salt in there. Your body needs salt when you're down there, 90 degrees, sweating. I mean, we could have packed and sent them lunches down there, and it probably wouldn't have ministered to them like two scoops of tuna, a little bit of mud, uh, milk, and that Bible that was down there. That's what kept them alive. The Word of God kept them alive. And friends, the Word of God can keep you alive too. I mean, when you look at it, if you don't have Jesus, you're stuck in the pit. You are. But that rescue pod of Christ can rescue and save you and restore a relation that will bring life and life abundant. My life's not the greatest. I struggle too, but you know what? I have never been able to face anything that I didn't come out of it okay. I'm standing here before you today because of the hand of God that's been over my life from before I was even born. God has a plan. And His plan is to wrap His arms around you and to embrace you and to love you and to rescue you and to walk with you and to have a relationship with you to restore you to a fullness and a oneness with Him and a God that would do that to the extent that that rescue pot he sent down, he didn't pull it back up with a rope. He flattened it out with some hammers and some nails and he nailed it on a tree. And he sacrificed it because of his love for you and his love for me. And that's how important you are for him. I'm going to give you some other scriptures that, Brian, I'm going to flip through here. 
go over to number eight. Jesus said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But then he gives the promise, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul wrote this, we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given us. James wrote, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that, you're, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Paul said, In all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When we face these struggles, when I face a struggle, when I'm victorious of it, I bring that knowledge and victory back to the body of Christ as testimony to glorify God. When you overcome a tragedy or a situation or a struggle in your life, that's testimony. God is preparing you and building you and molding you into the likeness of His Son for His glory. And those challenges that you're victorious over through the Holy Spirit and through Christ Jesus is things that God will use to strengthen the Christian family. The victory that that man, that 60-some-year-old man had, and I, I want to speak to everybody in here that's at least my age or older, don't ever think that your life is over. Don't ever think that God can't use you. Don't ever get so focused on looking at today that you can't look ahead to tomorrow because it was a senior citizen that had that Bible stuck in his pocket down there and pulled that out and shared the Word of God and people were saved and came to know Christ Jesus and that Word of God kept them strong for 69 days down in a dark hole until they were rescued. And the world can try to strip it and atheists can write articles all they want to but you look at that community and that country down there and they were blessed because they are a nation for the most part that gives glory to God. And I'm not going to get into denominationalism or whatever. They give glory to God. You know, many, many years ago, our forefathers left, left lands where they could not worship God to come to this country to be able to worship freely the one true God. I can trace personally on my father's side, my family roots back to 1640, going up the James River. We have some paperwork there. I, my younger brother has it to pass on and to keep, but we have a, a ship's manifesto chart. My wife and I got privy to it after we were married, it was showed. It's kind of like a family treasure that we have that states who we are. But my kin, my father's kin, came to this country to be able to worship God. And this country was formed as a nation under God. Joseph, in all of his struggles, was a testimony to God. And we're going to see that. Because of God's favor in Joseph and who Joseph was, son of Israel, Egypt was blessed. We look at this country today. Are we still a nation under God? I wonder. A commentator had said this week, and he was talking about, he had went back and looked in the Bible, and he was looking at the God of Baal and, and who, who Baal was and what kind of God he was. And he was a God of weather and a God of economy, and a God of war. And today, what are people buying into? We got people that are more concerned about, about the environment and the changing of the temperature and the saving of this and the saving of that to the point that they love that more and focus on that more than they do God. They have faith in that. We put our, coming up here, we have an opportunity to embrace the freedom that God has allowed us to have in this country by going and voting. I hope you're going to vote for godly people and godly leaders. I hope you're going to vote in accordance with God's word. We have an opportunity to go and exercise that freedom and, and, and to vote. But people are trying to steal that from us. 
people want to want us to put faith not in God and not in His Word, but in some superstar out there somewhere. It's got it all figured out. And the reality is, we're so we're so willing to throw out what's there to put in something that we don't know anything about. My prayer is that God shows me some history with some of these people. I want to see if this man has walked and voted in accordance with God. Because I got one vote and I want to make it count. I want this nation to be a nation under God again. I want my grandchildren who haven't even been born yet to experience the freedom of knowing the one and true living God, a God that loves us so much that leaves heaven and earth, heaven to come to earth in the form of Jesus Christ to rescue them and to embrace them because he wants to bless them. And we have people trying to steal that from us all the time. Trying to steal your faith. Trying to steal your hope. Trying to take away your vision. Praise be to God for godly people with godly vision. Amen? And God does say that he knows the plans that he has for us, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. In 2 Corinthians, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far as outweighs all of or them all. And a closing scripture has just such a powerful scripture to embrace as some of us are fighting these pits of life and some of us are wondering what the future is and the world is telling us that it's all going to come crashing down and there's no hope that's out there. I can't live like that, people, can you? I got to walk in hope. I got to walk in godly vision. I got to embrace the fact that all things come together for those that are in, in Christ. I've got to embrace that God loves me and wants to prosper me. I've got to embrace that God wants us to be a, a nation under his, his love and His grace. In Romans 8, the victory chapter. I hope that you're living in Romans 8. I spent the first part of my life living in Romans 7. And I'm trying so hard now to live in Romans 8. And I hope that you are too. For if God is with us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for you if your faith is in Him. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall